Thank you for listening to Nomad's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. More than 10,000 Falun Gong practitioners protested peacefully in Beijing. Protesters gathered on the streets outside the Chinese Communist Party headquarters to the largest demonstration since the Tiananmen Square Massacre in 1981年。法輪功教人向善,練的人不是越多越好嗎?這是個可遇不可求的機會,好好把握。認定法輪功組織為非法組織,予以警惕。可这上面全是假的你为什么要杀你的父母法轮功从法轮功里面学来的从死刑捡到十五年他马上就老实了干得不错给了人民的安宁家庭的安宁你们可别乱来啊你怎么也相信啊咱们得把真相告诉人们站
there were 70 million to 100 million people practicing Falun Gong in China. And how? what are the first steps in making a film about this subject, considering the nature of the story, considering the oppressive tactics of the Chinese Communist Party against any type of narrative other than their own? Is it difficult to kind of get a movie up and running, even in North America, um, when, you disc- when you're dealing with these kind of issues? Well, for, for me, um, I certainly was not a stranger to human rights atrocities in China and in terms of uh, the persecution uh, against Falun Gong uh, in particular. Um, this is perhaps one of the largest religious persecution happening to this day. Mm. And given that over 100 million people were practicing Falun Gong in China, um, it's safe to say every one of them has friends or families who were likely implicated. So this is in a very large scale. And it's really something uh, that's underreported in the West for various reasons. So this is the, the exact story that needs to be told. Yep. It needs to be known worldwide. And that's why I think it's worthwhile to make a film. I, I think so as well. And I think to me that also kind of talks about the importance of that filmmaking can have. Films can really share stories about figures of the present, figures of the past that we, we maybe not have heard of before. Um, like, for example, 12 Years a Slave with North, uh, Solomon Northup or um, movies like Hacksaw Ridge or The Killing Fields, um, just to name a few over the years that have been released. They've really shown to light not only moments in history, but people in history as well. And I think that's really important. Do you, do you agree with that as well? Absolutely. And I have um, all these members telling me many times, uh, in particular in regards to human rights uh, stories, if you send people a report, they may or may not read it. And there's only so much that you can understand from the facts. But if you tell them a good story, in particular uh, through a film, they resonate with this story and they're compelled to take action. And that's what we want from uh, audience members who would experience a story about a human rights issue. So uh, cinema is uh, very powerful in that regard. Do you have a moment in your life as a, as a young man, as a prosperous filmmaker, or even before that, that you watched a movie and really moved you not only in the way that you look at the world, but in what you wanted to do as in become a filmmaker? Like, for example, when I was in my late teens, I remember watching Sidney Lumet's Serpico. Um, it was on late at night here in Australia. I watched the whole thing, and it just made me fall in love with movies in another way. But not only that, it really kind of helped develop a kind of like a world of view in regards to the themes in that movie as well. Do you have a movie that did that for you when you were younger? Hmm, it's hard. It's, it's difficult to pinpoint uh, one film or several films that really changed me that way. But I, I've loved the cinema since I was young. And uh, well, I'm not really proud of this, but I sometimes skipped classes and to go to a, uh, a local cinema that was oh. uh, named as a uh, workers club. We've all done that. It's okay. <laughs> they would charge uh, a nominal fee for anyone to see uh, older films and things like that. Mm-hmm. But for me, uh, films really has the power to open people's eyes and, and uh, touching hearts at the same time. And uh, of course, if I had uh, the attention of the world's media, then probably that's even a quicker way to raise awareness on human rights issues. But I don't have that. And I think uh, cinema and, and you know whether documentaries or narrative films would probably have a long lasting effect. In, in, in that regard. Of course, considering the nature of the film, filming in China uh, was not on the cards whatsoever. Um, Unsilence was filmed in Taiwan. Um, you hired cast and crew in Taiwan um, to take part in the film. Considering the movie and its reputation and uh, the, the themes in the movie, is it hard to put a cast and crew together? Did it, was there any type of trepidation from people who perhaps wanted to take part of the film, but afraid of some type of backlash for themselves and maybe family back in uh, the mainland China? Well, I still remember our first uh, meeting. Uh, I told my team, 
we're going to make a film about China, but there are two things you need to know. One, we can't use Chinese location. Two, we can't use Chinese cast. So good luck. <laughs> and that's essentially uh, the challenges we uh, we were up against. I thought filming this in Taiwan would be relatively easier, given that the, the people in Taiwan embrace democracy. They certainly want to, you know, help make a film to demonstrate the value of, of freedom in Taiwan. Mm-hmm. But uh, I was I was wrong. Uh, even in Taiwan, many people were afraid that either their personal career or their personal safety might be in jeopardy. So we had uh, cast and crew members backing off even after accepting our offer. We had uh, location owners uh, asking us to leave when our team is decorating the set. So uh, even after a long day of production, we quite often have to uh, scramble to look for a location for the next day. I believe within uh, two months of production, uh, our core team had only one day off. In that time working there, um, was COVID a any, any issue whatsoever? What type of timeline are we talking about? Uh, we were. Uh, I was in Taipei for a half a year uh, in twenty twenty one. And does COVID have an issue in whatsoever in the filming in filmmaking? Do you have to undergo um, different processes? Do you have to go different undergo different kind of safety protocol to make sure you have a smooth shoot? At that time, we were really fortunate that Taiwan had almost no local cases for a long period of time, but there was still strict protocol in place, uh, which we duly followed, and. Uh, I think after we left, uh, they st- the local cases started to emerge. Oh, wow. But all in all, we were uh, really lucky to be able to film this in Taiwan. A, a prominent theme that comes through when I watched on Silence is the nature of propaganda. Um, so the Chinese Com- Communist Party have something called the Publicity Department, which from what I, I remember, that was actually called the Propaganda Department. I, gave, I guess they gave themselves a little bit of a, a marketing change there in the way they presented themselves. Um, and what's really interesting in regards to how the, the propaganda department ch- treated the whole um, issue of, of Falun Gong is that they really, you know, created an impression towards the Chinese people that Ch- Falun Gong was a cult, that it was an evil movement. And it, it essentially turned the whole country, country men and country women, into kind of like quasi agents or informants. There's nowhere any of these um, people, any of these students could run to without being exposed to someone on the street. Someone would dot them out. It's really interesting, isn't that, about how a whole country can turn on a group of people just like that and um, can really just rat them out at any given moment. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, the senior leaders in the Communist Party uh, understood this really, really well. And they uh, said... <clears throat> The Communist Party survived based on two things. One is the pen and the other is the gun. Mm. Of course, uh, referring to propaganda and violence. And that's what they did. Uh, Well, if you look at all the human rights atrocities in the last several decades, quite often you will see campaigns of uh, vilification, demonization, you know, preceding the, the violence to justify the violence. And this is also what's happening in China. Um, at the peak of the persecution, uh, thousands of, uh, I think over uh, close to 2,000 articles uh, were published on the People's Daily and uh, uh, on, on many state TV uh, channels. Uh, you see over 20 hours of programming every day demonizing Falun Gong. Mm-hmm. So uh, not only uh, domestically, also internationally. And that's why even now uh, you still see some misconceptions about the movement thanks to the uh, the propaganda from China. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by 80s Tees. 80s Tees is an online retailer of licensed t-shirts and pop culture gear from your favorite movies, TV shows, cartoons, video games, comic books, and musicians. Celebrate your inner 80s nerd and click on the link in the show notes below to get the raddest retro t-shirts delivered to your door. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by Loot Crate. Founded in 2012, 
Loot Crate is the worldwide leader in fan subscription boxes. Loot Crate partners with industry leaders in entertainment, gaming, sports, and pop culture to deliver monthly themed crates, produce interactive experiences in digital content, and film original video productions. No matter what you geek out about, Loot Crate has a subscription box for you. To get your very own exclusive collectibles, apparel, and gear delivered to your door, be sure to click on the link in the show notes below. A vital moment in the film is the Tiananmen Square self-immolation event. And for people who don't know, pretty much on, um, I think it was like Chinese New Year, which was um, 23rd of January in 2001, um, it was, it was you know, supposedly five members of Falun Gong um, set themselves alight in Tiananmen Square. And ever since then, or even from that time, there's been high doubts whether this was something that was um, actually happened or whether it was something that was staged by the Communist Chinese Party. Um, it's really interesting because I actually covered um, that uh, event um, with a documentary that came out a couple of years ago called Ask No Questions. I got to watch that documentary, talk to the filmmaker about it, and it seems to me, having watched that documentary, did the research on it, that it was an event that was staged by the, the, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and that really kind of really though, took the whole propaganda kind of aspect of this whole thing to a new extreme. Um, when you look at that moment specifically in the in the persecution and propaganda against the Falun Gong movement, do you also believe that the uh, Tiananmen Square um, self-immolation incident was staged as well by the CCP? Well, in the very beginning when this whole thing came out, I was I was a little confused, to be honest. Um, because of this, I just couldn't imagine how would people set themselves on fire. And I um, couldn't imagine that, that if, if the government was behind it. But now looking back, there are so many evidence surfaced. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that this is the, these people who are rather victims of the self immolation they are not Falun Gong practitioners. Mm. Um, and yeah. yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I've also uh, done my own research in, in writing this film from the, uh, the reporters I talked to, from the uh, articles by uh, the Washington Post, research done by Human Rights Watch. There is compelling evidence that this is uh, a campaign of state propaganda. Yeah, I, I from watching that documentary, Ask No Questions and, and looking into it uh, since then as well, I, I, I believe that to be so as well. Um, and I think it comes to to the fore another issue in regards to uh, the CCP's crackdown against the, not only the, the Falun Gong movement but people who practice uh, religion um, in China is in, in political enemies as well. Is that the nature of their violent tactics that they have towards um, suspects, towards prisoners, towards um, activists? Um, there's a real, there's a brutality, like almost a sadistic brutality to the to their their violent uh, means of extracting information. And your movie really doesn't um, shy away from showing that. But it's interesting. It's you had to kind of create something of a balance, don't you? On one end, you don't want to shy away from the brutality of the reality of the violence that's inflicted upon these people. But at the other end, you don't want to make a horror movie, do you? Um, you want to show the horror of the situation, but you don't want to take it too far um, that it's almost kind of like an exploitive kind of horror movie kind of style of violence. Was it was it difficult trying to find that balance between um, portray the portrayals of the reality based of the, of the violence as opposed to, you know, maybe going over the top and, and maybe um, uh, re making something so repulsive that people would not want to watch? Because I imagine it would be difficult on your part to get that balance right. Right. It was uh, quite some work to try to strike the right balance, uh, exactly as you uh, described. In the end, we actually had to dial down in terms of depicting the violence, uh, because through the uh, interviews I've done with victims, with survivors, um, quite often it was so terrible that by if we really show them, then people wouldn't be able to watch the film. So in that in that regard, uh, we try to you know suggest 
uh, we try to let let the viewers uh, imagine. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we cannot shy away because it's such a uh, a part of the reality that's that people are living this reality every day. Um, so that's the balance we're trying to uh, trying to strike, certainly. Prior to this film, well, prior to One Silence being released on video on demand, you actually did have a theatrical run in the United States, in Canada as well. Um, even in my neighbouring country of New Zealand, I believe there's still screenings going on over there at the moment. What type of reactions have you had from people um, who have seen the movie? Have people reached out who had, you know, maybe family members as victims or didn't they themselves be victims um, of this crackdown against um, Falun Gong? Have they also reached out in regards to the movie and, and what you've tried to achieve in presenting their story? I was really moved by the audience response um, we were told that uh, many screenings ended with standing ovations. And we also received uh, numerous messages from people all over North America. Uh, now it, it also is having a theatrical release in Taiwan as well. Mm -hmm. So from audience members in Taiwan and people um, shared with their experiences if they were victims or other audience members who had no idea at all that this is still happening in China. And I was also uh, heartened to learn that many people look beyond um, a human rights story in China. They also see the values of uh, truth versus lies, and they find strength in the stories, which they can apply to their daily lives when they need courage to speak up. So all in all, uh, I was really moved. So for everyone out there listening, releasing on video demand later this month, Unsilenced, um, really gripping, powerful filmmaking here, um, Leon. And I just want to say congratulations to you with the film. Anyone out there want to find more information, you can go to unsilencedmovie.com. That shows all different types of information and trailers and um, all the any type of release dates or anything that you want to find. Um, I really recommend people watch this movie and then the other people know to watch this movie as well because I believe it is an important piece of filmmaking about a very relevant, important story that I don't think, I don't think gets covered enough um, in the press. And um, Leon Lee, congratulations to, to you. I think you've done terrific work here and um, I just want to say best of luck with the film's release and I thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews podcast interviews and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.